Good morning, it's news from the Roots on Mountain Stream TV. Today is uh, Monday, July 16th, 2018. I'm Avram Friedman. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Enrique Gomez, the president of the NAACP. We're making a habit of this on Monday morning, <laughs> okay. uh, which I think is a good thing to do. Um, and what we, what we thought we'd focus on today are the uh, six amendments to the Constitution that have been proposed by the Republican leadership, that is more than proposed, they have been uh, passed into law, um, meaning that there will be a referendum on each one of these um, amendments in, in the general election this year. Um, and this is kind of an unprecedented thing. I mean, a, a, a constitutional amendment in the past has been a rare occurrence. But now it's almost as if the General Assembly is legislating through uh, amendments, yeah, rapid fire, yes, rapid fire amendments, and offering six amendments in one election uh, is, I believe, unprecedented. Um, and we're going to be talking about each one of these amendments and what it will mean to the people of uh, North Carolina. I I'm just going to focus in a little bit more. Um, I think I have us a little bit distant and let, okay. the, sounds let good. the viewers see us a little bit better. Okay, that sounds good. How are we going? We're good? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, see, you might want to, uh, you're, you might be a little bit on screen there. Move your chair a little bit more so that you don't uh, manage over see, here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's better. All right, we good. Good. So, uh, but do you have anything to say about the, the overall, uh, the scope of this and, and uh, well, uh, how this is being done? Yeah, yeah well, the uh, thing about this is that the NAACP, along with our coalition partners, really uh, in the past uh, decade or so have essentially seen the rise of extremist elements within the Republican Party that essentially are about a uh, sort of radical transformation of state government as well as a uh, sort of the economy. And essentially, in order to do that, they need to consolidate their power for a long period of time to make sure that uh, their uh, power grab does not get effectively challenged. So the organizing thing behind these amendments are essentially about consolidating power uh, in such a way so that uh, they are less accountable to their own voters. And uh, each one of these things are essentially an interlocking system. You know, all of these things kind of just by themselves, you know, are pretty egregious. But together, they form an interlocking system of power grab. Uh, all across uh, state government. It will create an office of the governor that will be weaker in many respects. Uh, it would increase chances of obtaining super majorities uh, for, uh, for a long period of time and to reduce accountability to the voters. So that's essentially what we're looking for. And the NAACP, as well as our coalition partners, have es are essentially asking voters to reject uh, the amendments having to do with this power grant. So I, it, it strikes me when, when I saw this happening, that maybe the Republican leadership is a little concerned that um, they might lose uh, their supermajority mm -hmm. and their majority in, in, in the General Assembly, and this is their attempt to cement in mm -hmm. changes mm -hmm. uh, to, to North Carolina law uh, even after they're out of power in a way that it would be very mm -hmm. difficult to reverse Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, the only way to undo a constitutional amendment is either, I guess, through a uh, court if, if it's unconstitutional, uh, yeah, or, and or, of court, yeah, or, or, or court, yeah. by another uh, vote of the people mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. overturn a constitutional amendment. And so, uh, what they're trying to do is cement in such things as the voter ID law and, mm -hmm. and other things in a way that it will be difficult to reverse, even if they should lose. Uh, their power and, and, and their majority or supermajority. So, so um, let's let's go over um, these one at a time. Let let me just run through all six of them, and 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 then we're going to go back and touch on each one of them. Uh, the first one that we want to talk about is the uh, the voter ID, the photo voter ID law. The second one is uh, they want to um, 
reduce the top rate of taxation um, in, in the uh, North Carolina income tax. The third one is they want to change the judicial system so that judges are no longer elected in North Carolina but are appointed. The third is they want an ethics uh, appointment. They want to change the way uh, commissions are appointed and uh, change the way um, uh, ethics are enforced in the North Carolina General Assembly and, and in the North Carolina government. Uh, the fourth one is uh, a system of uh, rights for the victims of crimes in North Carolina. And the final one is an affirmation that the people of North Carolina have the right to hunt and fish mm -hmm. and harvest mm -hmm. wildlife. Okay, um, so let's start with the... Uh, the which it was perhaps the most egregious uh, of these, which is the photo ID mm -hmm. law. Uh, this is a, a the, several years ago, um, the, G, the General Assembly passed a photo ID law. It was deemed unconstitutional by mm -hmm. the um, federal court. Yeah, the fourth district in 2016 uh, deemed it unconstitutional. Yes. And so now they want to cement it into law with a constitutional amendment, which I'm sure would be challenged again in, in federal mm -hmm. court. Um, but let's, let's talk about this um, and why this is such. I mean, on the face of it, um, many, uh, the argument is used that, well, if you go to an airport, if you go you want to get a library card if you want to do so many mm -hmm. get a driver's license uh, that it requires a photo ID why shouldn't uh, it also require a photo ID for mm -hmm. voting well you don't have a constitutional right to uh, board an airplane right. you uh, can be denied that that is a service you do not have a constitutional right to go and get uh, say a library card that is a privilege you do not have a constitutional right uh, to uh, to drive you can be denied uh, the ability to drive in this state and older states that is a privilege not a right but voting is a right voting is a right and in face value I guess you think of uh, the um, going over to the ballot box and uh, stating your name as being kind of like a transactional affair you know and uh, you could mask it in those terms uh, the thing about this is that it is a, um, potentially a violation of constitutional rights uh, for the following reason, and that is that um, you can you can essentially create an undue burden on uh, voters uh, when forcing to actually show uh, uh, procure um, uh, 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 government uh, issued ID in a sense that they have to take time to actually they have to actually gather documents to establish their identity to establish their nationality and all that and one of the things that we know is that historically uh, states uh, even localities have been rather irregular about uh, issuing uh, say uh, birth certificates or anything that is actually needed for you to actually establish your identity and your nationality and we know for instance that that impacts disproportionately the elderly uh, disproportionately uh, minorities and uh, lower income individuals so that is effectively a way in which you can suppress the vote and even if you have uh, some kind of um, policy that allows you to get an, a, an ID government issue ID free of charge still the burden of going um, it, it can be overwhelming you have for instance a case of Rosanella Eaton uh, who uh, at the end of ACP actually uh, worked with uh, for several years uh, once the uh, first uh, voter ID as part of the monster voter suppression law that was uh, passed a few years back uh, she had to uh, after voting for many many decades uh, and after having worked really hard to actually uh, as part of the movement uh, to restore voting rights to African Americans in the state um, she did not have the documentation needed in order to establish her identity because she was born in a gym Crow saw at South, uh, born at home, uh, where there was no easy or reliable way of actually issuing her documents. So it took actually several trips uh, to uh, DMV in order to actually show, establish that. And even then, you 
you can start to see how it begins to kind of like tally up. So uh, that is one way in which we are talking about show voter suppression. So right now in North Carolina, we have about uh, 381,000 uh, you know, eligible uh, NC voters, or about 5%, 5.6% 5 of the population that do not have a voter ID. So essentially what you have to do is ask them to actually get uh, or, or, or a government issue ID. Uh, we are talking about primarily seniors, uh, youth, low-income individuals, people of color, people with disabilities. So uh, we actually did this experiment back uh, um, before we had the fourth uh, district uh, ruling in 2016. We actually did have a primary in North Carolina in March of 2016 where a voter, uh, a, a government issue ID, had to be presented in order for you to actually vote. Uh, the discovery was that uh, there was about 1,400 individuals in the state that were turned away at the polls. Uh, they could not vote in March 2016 because they did not have an ID. This was a primary election. Excuse me, this is a primary election. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so that is sort of like an issue. Now, we also know from other places, uh, sort of other uh, locations, other states, what is the effect of the having that particular stuff. So for instance, uh, we can talk about, say, Wisconsin and uh, other places as well. So. Um, for instance, in 2014, the U.S. Government Accountability Offices um, found that strict voter IDs uh, reduce voter participation by two to three percentage points. When we should be working really hard to make the ballot more accessible, uh, we are essentially are suppressing the overall. And uh, we're talking, and we're talking about in a single state, tens of thousands of votes could actually be suppressed, which could actually make a difference. So many uh, elections are decided by my much thinner margins than that. So a 2016 study, you know, from the University of Wisconsin Madison, looking at the vo a Wisconsin photo ID law in the 2016 election, uh, they concluded that thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of otherwise eligible voters were deterred uh, from voting by the ID law, a um, margin much greater, much greater than uh, was um, in which uh, that decided the presidential election in that state. So, um, so there. Um, researcher, and I'm just going to quote that, stated that an eligible voter who cannot vote because of the ID law is disenfranchised. So this is a disenfranchisement amendment uh, that we're proposing here in North Carolina. And continue on that quote, that in itself is a serious harm to the integrity of the electoral process. Moreover, we have the following issue, okay, and that is that uh, as the entire voter uh, turnout gets suppressed, uh, that disproportionately affects minority voters. So we're talking about uh, people of colors are less likely to have access to photo IDs and you have a study or a report from 2017 the University of California San Diego and uh, Brooklyn University they found that vote Latino participation was most impacted by the presence of voter IDs so for instance uh, the Latino participation dropped by seven percentage points 7.1 percentage points uh, in, in elections uh, and 5.3 points lower in primaries with strict ID states and other states. So strict voter ID laws, like the amendment, which is being proposed here in North Carolina, uh, will make it harder for African Americans, for Latinos, for Asian Americans, for multiracial Americans to vote uh, access to a ballot. What's interesting about this is that this is obviously uh, both the original mo muster, uh, voter suppression law as well as this particular amendment are essentially a response to what happened in 2008 in North Carolina, where you essentially, 2008, yeah. which is that we saw, for instance, a coalition, show of a very broad coalition of whites, African Americans, Latinos, uh, Native Americans, that essentially came together, working class folks came together and uh, essentially uh, gave the electoral uh, votes, uh, electoral college votes of North Carolina to Barack Obama. And we know, for instance, that uh, people that had been strategizing, extremists within the Republican Party who had been strategizing about this, they sort of keyed on and zeroed in on the fact that this coalition existed. And for instance, when, um, um, for instance, back in 2000 and, um, 2012, where the election over there, where that didn't actually happen, um, uh, uh, what you had though was already the enactment of all these voter suppression tactics here in the state. And one of the things that was written uh, within strategies is that yes, we finally destroyed the uh, Barack Obama coalition in North Carolina. And the thing about this is, is something that happens across the country is what Reverend Barber showed, pointed out, points out in abundance that all of 
all of these voter suppression laws that you're seeing uh, occur in the state, uh, across the nation actually, uh, are being implemented or being forced through in states with the largest increase in, um, in minority population. Mm -hmm. So this is a response to specific demographics. Now the thing about this is that this is addressing a problem that is not actually real. You know, it's like we're talking about just a, a really handful of cases out of tens, potentially hundreds of millions of votes cast in the last few decades where people actually misrepresented themselves in the, in the ballot. And we have all these controls you know, to, the, to, to have that. We have all this accountability. You have all this, all this fines, prison time, all of that. Uh, so, but the thing about this is that if you really wanted to change the election through voter fraud, this is the most inefficient, <laughs> incompetent way of actually doing it. Why? Because uh, for a small fraction of the cost, I mean, if you are actually buying votes, if you are paying someone to misrepresent themselves, uh, to misrepresent who they are at the ballot box and paying all this stuff, it would be so much cheaper to actually hack into the machines <laughs> themselves. You know, and we are essentially are seeing a forest. You're seeing a plethora of all of these uh, different uh, um, voter technologies out there. Um, really, I mean, if you ask me, the, the only foolproof uh, method of actually doing uh, voting would essentially cast paper ballots. That would be the only thing that has the most that greatest security. Basically, anything that has a computer can be hacked. And it wouldn't take that much to actually hack into a machine, actually uh, create a circumstance where you have. For instance, you could essentially insert a single line of code into the uh, into the uh, code that runs an electronic uh, voting machine to say that okay well you know at the end of the day we have you know um, this particular uh, uh, this particular machine you had 2002 votes for Al Gore and uh, two, uh, 2000 for George W. Bush well you know you make sure that you actually kind of look do the switch so that you are reporting 2004. Um, for George Bush and 2000 for Al Gore. That's that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, we are also knowing that we now are experiencing, now that we're getting show of all this Mueller investigation by indictments, we are seeing that in fact, in, in, uh, foreign interference into our elections in the form of deliberately presenting mis uh, misinformation to the public, miseducating the public about the issues and the candidates uh, is the biggest problem, right, by far. So instead of addressing that, they are addressing this fictitious problem. So uh, it is uh, essentially a very serious is issue. And here in North Carolina, it is about voting rights, particularly for minorities. And we talked last time about the 14th Amendment, the importance of the 14th Amendment. Uh, the NAACP's legal strategy uh, in attacking these things in the court essentially are based upon uh, the, uh, the 14th Amendment, the fundamental right to vote that was given to all citizens of the United States regard regardless of race. So for instance, uh, in, um, in for the 2006 March election, yeah, where, we where we actually had voter ID here in North Carolina, so we're talking March 2016. Uh, so African Americans made up uh, in that election 23% of all the votes. However, there were 34% of the 1,400 voices that were silenced in the previous law. Mm -hmm. So uh, the previous voter ID law. So this is essentially is a, co a, a challenge uh, for us uh, to do this. And the thing about this is that we cannot necessarily count on now Supreme Court, if you are going to pack uh, the Supreme Court with extremist uh, judges, uh, like we, we have the Brett Kavanaugh uh, situation right there, that are not going to uphold uh, the key provisions of the Voting Rights Act, um, and, if, uh, and, and misinterpret the 14th Amendment, then uh, this particular um, this particular amendment uh, essentially would create this regime in North Carolina. And the thing about this is that the language, as I understand it, is I intentionally vague. There are no details about what is going to be the structure of uh, the voter ID, right? Um, are they going to accept student IDs? Are you going to uh, um, uh, uh, recognize uh, any type of government issue ID that's not a driver's license? Mm -hmm. um, could the legislator institute some kind of law that in addition to all the IDs that you have, that you have to go back into a government office and procure a completely different voter ID? They could do that. 
right? They, they could actually do that and make it even more onerous for more people to vote. So we are in fact urging uh, people to go out, uh, not just uh, vote no in November, but also to educate the people around you. If you are going to, if you want to uh, understand more of this and where these fears are coming from, you can always go to democracync.org, which is one of our coalition partners and essentially have a lot of analysis having to do with this. Uh, we are urging people to write letters of the editor. We're talking to, uh, urging people to go and talk to their neighbors about this. Get them educated about this issue because uh, even though right now uh, federal court has deemed such a law unconstitutional according to the Constitution of the uh, United States, um, we are still vulnerable for something like this to actually be enshrined now into that Constitution of North Carolina, and that is not good. So, so the only thing I, I can add to that um, is the basis upon which uh, they, the, the General Assembly has wants to had passed the previous voter ID law and is attempting mm -hmm. to pass this constitutional amendment is on the fear that the massive voter fraud is taking place, and that's mm -hmm. that's why Obama won yeah. North Carolina in 2008, and and that there's no deterrent to voter fraud. And that is totally false because mm -hmm. it's a felony to participate yeah. mm -hmm. in voter fraud. And if you mm -hmm. are somebody who is pretending to be someone else and going voting, mm -hmm. and if you're caught, you could spend five years in jail. And, and, yeah. and, and that's a, a tremendous deterrent. Not many people are going to take a risk like that just mm -hmm. to cast a, a, a vote. E mm -hmm. As important as it is to cast a vote, uh, you're not going to find a lot of people who you can pay ten dollars to go and do that or whatever, you yeah. know. Uh, and 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 to be fair, mm -hmm. historically there have been waves, in, and Chicago is notable mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in, in some large cities, uh, w it, back in, in the days of prohibition and, and those days, uh, th there was actually f voter fraud, mm -hmm. but it usually wasn't live people. Who, it was usually dead people who voted. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so someone coming in the middle of the night, the night before, and stuffing those those ballot boxes. And the machine was just so mm -hmm. thoroughly controlled by Mayor Daley, and and, yeah. uh, and that that uh, there was no fear mm -hmm. of of being prosecuted because the police were in on it, the uh, you know the judicial system was in on it, and, and it was it was just a locked down system. Mm -hmm. Nothing similar to that. Yeah exists today in North Carolina. Um, but the thing about this is that now, of course, uh, we're living in a different age with a different technology. I mean, the cost-efficient yes. way, the way that you make it even more hidden and yeah. less likely for you to actually uh, to actually fail at essentially stealing an election and uh, violating uh, the uh, or distorting the will of the people is essentially to hack into it. If you have an electronic system, you can hack into it one way or the other. And we know that foreign interests have tried to uh, essentially hack into the uh, state board of election uh, computers of several states across the country. That is the threat. That is the issue. And and. And we also know that the, the, the uh, organizations, the individuals who own the voting machines uh, have a, a very heavy Republican yeah. bent. Mm -hmm. and, so and we're talking the, about Dibold. Yeah, yeah, and there are, there's a lot of speculation that they, these machines could have been programmed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and as I understand it, it's not actually the voting machines. Mm -hmm. It's the transfer mechanism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. where, where you have this, if you notice, when you go to vote, um, you, you type in, you know, you, you mm -hmm. push the buttons and everything, and then they plug in this unit mm -hmm. that transfers mm -hmm. the vote to the tally uh, mm -hmm. machine, which actually gets transferred. And there is apparently an executable file in that transfer mechanism, yeah. so you could check the machine out and then everything would look perfect, but <laughs> it's, yes. it's in the transfer mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, so who, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a many ways that, that mm -hmm. the election could be rigged electronically, mm -hmm. which, and, and I mm -hmm. totally agree with the notion that computers mm -hmm. should not be part of elections. Computers mm -hmm. are valuable tools for yeah. business and for personal use mm -hmm. that can store a lot of information and help you out in your life mm -hmm. a lot and make life more efficient in a lot of ways. But 
in in elections, the f the first thing you're looking for is not speed and efficiency; it's accuracy and verifiability. Mm -hmm. And computers m do not help those yeah. aspects of the election. Uh, mm -hmm. Verifiability and accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yes, paper ballots, that's what they're doing in many countries now. Uh, Canada yeah. mm -hmm. counts their votes, uh, they're all paper ballots, yeah. they count mm -hmm. them by hand. doesn't matter how long it takes, doesn't matter if you don't get the results mm -hmm. that night and they can be reported on the evening mm -hmm. news. Mm -hmm. What matters most is that they can be verified, all parties can witness the counting of the votes, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you know then it's, it's real and, and verifiable. So. Um, the, the voter ID law uh, in no way makes our elections more safe and secure. It does the exact opposite, and, and, and it suppresses the vote. And throughout, you know, the progression of American history has been an expansion of human rights mm -hmm. in general. The trage trajectory has been toward the expansion of human rights and the inclusion of more and more people until the, the, the last ten years. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, where there now is an effort to contract um, the particip participation in democracy. Up until now, we've been trying to find ways to expand uh, participation in the voting process by ex by having extended voting periods. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, prior to the to the actual election day, mm -hmm. and, and 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 different methods of expanding voter voter participation and and the populations that are able to participate, and now suddenly uh, that's being reversed. And you have to ask yourself: I mean, are we trying to become a more democratic or less democratic society? Mm -hmm. And and uh, certainly this is a, a step in the wrong direction in terms mm -hmm. of, of that. Okay. Let's move on. So, so we, we, we would, I mean, we'd urge mm -hmm. any, everybody to vote against this Absolutely, yeah. number one um, um, amendment, which is, uh, and this is House Bill 1092, and it will be on the, um, on the ballot as the voter ID ballot um, measure. Okay. The second issue is um, an act to amend the North Carolina Constitution to provide that the maximum tax rate on incomes cannot exceed 7%. Now, I believe this was actually raised to 10%. Well, um, it lowers the cap on income no, it's from 10 it's to 7. 7. They go, it it is from 10 to 7. Uh, originally it was 10 and now it's 7, mm -hmm. which is even worse, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what's your take on this amendment? Well, um, this shows like the position behind this, and that is that, um, well, it sounds like a good thing, right? It, you know, it put, puts an upper cap as to how much income you have. Uh, it can, can be actually taxed. Uh, well, well, here's the thing. Um, what this does is that it limits the ability of the state to actually respond uh, to uh, what is going on in the ground economically. That's what it does. Right. So, uh, for instance, if um, the state has several obligations, uh, uh, not least of which is, for instance, uh, having our educational system, a state educational system, uh, it needs to do maintenance of the infrastructure, having to do with roads, having to do with uh, show of power, energy, uh, everything that we need in order to actually run the economy. Uh, it's uh, these are sort of some essential functions. If, for instance, we enter into a into a recession where you have mass unemployment where you have um, essentially a, a decrease in productivity and incomes, then this puts us in a bind uh, because we cannot, uh, for instance, uh, have any kind of tax on, uh, on the upper incomes as well. The people that benefit most from any kind of economic activity, uh, we cannot ask them to have their fair share of the, uh, of, the of, the, of, the, of the entire process. So if you have this massive short call, what does that force our legislatures to do? It forces them to raise the um, tax on goods and services fees right. and, and, and fees like that. That's what it does. So then it, you, you establish essentially a regressive tax right. structure. You establish a regressive tax structure. And this, this is highly problematic 
right? Because that means that you're shifting the burden of the tax base towards the lower income instead of the top brackets. Now, lastly, we actually have the uh, following issue. Uh, we, we actually, economically, we are living in unusual times. Because, for instance, when you look nationally about our unemployment rate, right, we have uh, probably 4% or less than 4%, which is essentially full employment for all of us and purposes. We, we're experiencing full employment. And you would think, according to the law of supply and demand, that people would actually be earning more since mm -hmm. uh, it, it, they can be more competitive about being able to sell their labor you know, for, for, uh, for, for a higher income, uh, high, higher rates. But that's not what's happening, right? The income is not increasing in proportion to the demand of amount of work, right? And to a certain extent, we're seeing show of limits on. So, so right now, we're probably living in a, in a region or, or a moment in time of uh, show of close uh, to peak, peak employment, and, and this is sort of sets the state potentially for a recession. So it would be a huge mistake to enshrine something like this into the state constitution if we, if we are seeing the possibility of, uh, say, another recession cycle might be coming up in the third or fourth quarter of this year, or e even into the future. It's just a bad move, right? So uh, we have uh, massive income inequality. Now, you have to go back to the 1920s to see a greater disparity uh, between concentration of wealth in the operations of, of the society as opposed to the vast majority of us. So, so this, this is essentially highly problematic. So we are urging voters to vote no also on this amendment. We need to have that flexibility. We need to see the people that benefit most from the productivity of the society to also be able to share on the investments on the state and the uh, well-being of the economy regionally as well as nationwide by essentially making that in, be willing to to share that burden of the investment of the infrastructure that is needed in order to run the economy of the state yeah yeah i agree uh, th this is uh, a draconian um amendment that's being proposed it's totally irresponsible and unrealistic it, if if this passes uh north carolina will be screwed <laughs> mm -hmm. uh it means that we're going to see cuts in public education uh, pup, uh cuts in all uh human services um it, it, and and i think that's it, it, this is a a basic sort of libertarian uh, philosophy that's being promoted w with this constitutional amendment, uh, and um, it doesn't it doesn't grapple with the realities of the situation. I mean, we'll see massive human suffering if if this this passes. The idea here is to lower the budget, lower the budget, and and, and uh, the market will take care of everything. That's the philosophy that is is behind this. And, and what we're ta calling for here is basically a flat tax, it, basically a flat tax in terms of um, the, the uh, income tax. I mean, a 7% is an extremely low rate mm -hmm. for, for an income tax. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about even for the, the highest income earners, they could not be taxed more than 7%, if I understand yeah. this. Mm -hmm. And and that, that's I, I'm not. What is it now in North Carolina? Is it fourteen percent or or uh, mm -hmm. e even higher, perhaps? Well, um, so like ten percent according to the law, what, what we have currently right now. Right now, it's ten percent. Is, yeah. is yeah. the uh, is the cap? Yeah. Is the cap okay? Yeah, and and that's not meeting our needs. We're seeing cuts in public education yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and, and other s goods and services. Uh, or uh, government services, we're seeing environmental regulations getting gutted and enforcement agencies mm -hmm. getting gutted. And, and so if you're concerned about public education, if you're concerned about the environment, if you're concerned about a fair criminal justice system, uh, and, and um, all of these um, government functions would have to be cut if this constitutional amendment were to pass, and I think it would be disastrous uh, if that were to happen. So, vote no. <laughs> vote no <laughs> on that on one. On income tax okay. cap. Now, this is the one that I find I might have to um, sort of play devil's advocate on, the, okay. uh, on this one, the judicial appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some aspects of this that I might actually agree mm -hmm. 
with with what the uh, Republicans are proposing here, in in some way, I agree with them. I th in, in some ways, except I think that they may be doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. You know, my reasons for wanting this maybe are different than the reasons mm -hmm. that that um, that Republicans are doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so this is an act to amend the Constitution of North Carolina to provide for nonpartisan judicial merit commissions for the nomination and recommendation of nominees when filling vacancies in the office of justice or judge of the General Court of Justice and to make other conforming changes to the Constitution. So do you want to talk about this or, or how about well, if, let, okay. let me give my perspective on this, okay. and, and then Go you ahead. Can answer this. Yes. Um, in the federal government, all judges are appointed. Hmm. And the rationale for that in the, in the United States Constitution is that justices should be above politics. Mm -hmm. they, they should not have to run for office. They should not have to be beholden to people who donate to to their political campaigns, they should not have to go around and try to uh, create alliances with various parts of the population in order to gain that office because once they get into office they are, it is their job to be completely impartial. They are supposed to be the conscience of the nation, those that adhere to the constitutional principles of the nation. Uh, in some states, including North Carolina, they abandoned that principle when, they, when the Constitution of the state uh, decided to elect judges. Mm -hmm. That makes judges uh, subject to all the pressures of other, other officers in, in the uh, other office holders who have to seek election. And so, um, in that sense, I tend to agree in principle with the idea of appointment of judges uh, through a commission that attempts to be nonpartisan and uh, is choosing people for their abilities rather than for their popularity. Um, and, and so um, I, I tend to agree with that general assess assessment. But it's obvious also that the reason that the Republican General Assembly is doing this at this mm -hmm. point is for purely partisan purposes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that they, what they are trying to do here is because the Supreme Court has overruled, for instance, the voter ID law mm -hmm. and the bathroom law mm -hmm. and, and other legisla extreme legislation that mm -hmm. they have attempted to pass, now they're trying to control the judiciary through the, mm -hmm. uh, by, by bypassing the electoral process and appointing judges that they feel would be more amenable to their ideas. And I understand that's the reason that they're doing this. Yeah, well, if you can think of this as a, kind of like an interlocking system. You know, yeah. these things, n these amendments by themselves, if they were just floating around doing their thing, then uh, they, they may or may not actually have much of an uh, effect. But the fact that they are part of show of a power grab that has actually several items. So, for instance, this particular amendment, what will do is that it will remove the governor's power to appoint judges when there is an opening, uh, say, between the elections, which is something that happens. And it gives the legislature, the uh, NC General Assembly, the power to appoint a commission to nominate a list of judges. So essentially what it does is that it essentially takes away a lot of these powers as well. But why take it away from the governor at this point in time anyway? Well, the thing about this is that the government, uh, governor, the office of the governor is the highest office uh, in this state that we can, uh, voters can directly appoint. You cannot gerrymander an election in, in order for you to gain uh, a governorship. You can't. But you can gerrymander an election so that a particular party uh, can uh, essentially have uh, 
uh, veto proof majority in the state legislature. And by the way, this is something that both Democrats and Republicans have historically done. Mm -hmm. right have done so essentially both parties kind of get some of the blame in terms of creating gerrymandering that's why we need show uh, non-partisan uh, commission to essentially create districts and take away the legislators ability of essentially electing this now this is not part of the um, uh, part of the amendment per se yeah. but the fact that we have gerrymandered elections okay where the uh, general assembly can get veto proof majority means that I uh, in that regime if you are taking powers away from the governor to give to the legislature, yeah. then you essentially uh, uh, is, uh, 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 consolidate the, the, your strangleholding power and take away accountability, uh, that accountability uh, from the voters. Maybe I'm okay. misunderstanding this, Amanda. Okay. Um, I, I this is the uh, judicial appointments, right? This mm -hmm. is judicial appointments. Th this is not creating. This is this is not gerrymandering. Oh no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But the thing about yeah. this is that uh, the power of this amendment emerges from the fact that we live in a gerrymandered state, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, if we had a fair districting created by a nonpartisan commission where you had accountability true, where voter, true representation where, yes. not just true representation but true accountability as well right right then it's like it, it would actually make sense I might actually okay. hear this amendment as being something like that uh, in my sense right now I, I'm going to vote against this particular amendment right. because I need to see a state with a non-partisan commission creating right. districts right. where voters are now allowed to select their legislators as opposed to legislators selecting their own voters right, right? so uh, so that's uh, that's why it's an interlocking system it all kind of works together sure. as well so the non-partisan sh shall consist of no more than nine members uh, whose appointments shall be allocated between chief justice of the supreme court the governor and the General Assembly as prescribed by law. Mm -hmm. So this this doesn't really move mm -hmm. um, power away from the governor, I don't believe, because right now the governor doesn't appoint judges either. No, it nobody appoints. doesn't, appoint. but it takes away, uh, say, in between sessions. In between sessions, uh, if you have a judicial uh, opening, uh, the governor, dies or yes, the governor can actually show like like uh, show. Uh, the and then now it yes. says not the governor doesn't yes. do that, but the general assembly actually uh, provides a list of I think it says yes, ten. It, ten, it, ten people and the governor chooses from that. What, list. what it does is that it creates an, a, a commission. Yeah. Okay, the uh, state legislature, the General Assembly, can create a commission to nominate the list of judges. Right. Okay, and the uh, NC legislature has the power to choose two names to send to the governor for approval of one appointment. Okay, so that's essentially what it does. Yeah. The last thing that it does uh, that is of concern to us is that uh, the legislature could add two Supreme Court seats in a special session. So if you see a particular ruling that doesn't go your way, all you have to do is create a special session and essentially uh, add two more seats uh, to pack the courts uh, uh, so that it does what the legislature and the extremists in the legislature could actually choose to do. So essentially it uh, essentially removes um, accountability from the government as long as we have a gerrymandered state like we have here in North right. Carolina. Okay, you've okay. convinced yeah. me to vote against this one. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, that's number three. Um, number four is Ethics Appointments Commission. Um, so, an act to amend the Constitution of North Carolina to establish a bipartisan board of ethics and elections enforcement and to clarify board appointments. Now, this, this is a case where they, I believe, the, sh the uh, General Assembly is usurping the power of the yeah. governor mm -hmm. again and, and um, trying to strip appointment uh, powers from the governor and giving it to the General Assembly. Is yeah, that? that's pretty much it. So yeah. it does something very similar to this. And again, well, you know, if we had a non gerrymander state where legislatures actually had uh, accountability to the voters. 
then maybe it's something like this would make sense. But the fact that the office of the governor is something that cannot be gerrymandered uh, uh, so that a party has a stranglehold on that office um, does create a circumstance where you have a power grab and extremists in the, uh, in the government, especially in the General Assembly, can essentially consolidate their power for, for a long time to go. So it, it, create, it, it appoints a merit commission. For instance. That's one of the, the aspects of this. That evaluates, for instance, judicial nominees for the public. It selects, uh, for instance, two judicial nominees to submit to a government for, oh, wait, hold on a second. Did I get this wrong? I think I, I essentially got this wrong. OK. Um, OK, there we go. So it removes the government's power to make a moment on boards and commission. Okay, it transfers power to the, from governor governor to the end to legislature power to make amendments for the board of commissions. Right? Okay, it re it essentially reduces uh, the current nine members of the board of a uh, state board of elections to eight members, with each party gets to appoint four members as well. So this is something that uh, gets gets to be taken away. So we essentially have an even number of members appointed by the majority and minority power, members result in the votes affecting issues like limiting early voting, right? And the thing about this is that right now we have uh, essentially a legislature that essentially passed a bill uh, that essentially is going to change uh, the early period, the early voting period, right? And uh, you essentially are uh, creating a situation in the State Board of Elections that essentially can create internal policies and interpretation of the law that is more favorable for voter suppression. So that essentially is the issue. Uh, that we that we have with this particular amendment. Yeah, and and again, just to emphasize the, the first point that you made is the governor is one of the few. There's a f there are several statewide elections in North Carolina in which all the people vote for one of one official or the other, and and the governor is one of those positions. Uh, you can't gerrymander the governor's. Yeah race because the whole state votes for, it, yeah. votes for the candidates for governor. So it's the voice of the people of the state that elect mm -hmm. the governor. Mm -hmm. And that's not true for any members of the General Assembly or the leadership of the General Assembly. Those are all subject to gerrymandering and political mm -hmm. manipulation. Um, and um, But the governor's office is not. And so when you strip uh, away powers from the governor, you are stripping them away from the voice of the entire population of the state. And I, I think that that needs to be emphasized. Uh, there's a reason. And, and even, you know, I think it was in 1996 that the governor, through, through a state constitutional amendment, first gained the veto power. North Carolina was the last state in the country in which the governor did not have a veto power. <laughs> uh, and, and so it, w it was the weakest uh, governorship. And it still remained the weakest weak. governorship mm -hmm. even after that. Mm -hmm. But it was somewhat strengthened by the veto power, which was mm -hmm. significant. Uh, now uh, there is an attempt to, to reverse that again. And, 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 and it's... It's important to, for people to understand how important that voice is, I think, that, that the governor have that, that power to override uh, the, um, the, the, the officers that are, can be won through gerrymandering of the General Assembly seats. Yeah, and as long as we have a situation where uh, the General Assembly, uh, people elected into that body, are not being accountable to their own voters, and they are insulating from any process of accountability through competitive elections, that is essentially very highly problematic. Uh, so, uh, and uh, there are even questions that we could raise about just about uh, every major piece of legislation that has been passed by the General Assembly since uh, 2010. Yeah. You know, if you have, for instance, a, a body that is being elected through unconstitutional uh, methodologies uh, system of elections. Yeah. So uh, vote no on uh, on the ethics and um, the commission on uh, appointments and, and uh, ethics law or amendment. 
I don't even know how that's going to be labeled. I, I guess um, an act to amend the Constitution of North Carolina to establish a bipartisan board of ethics and elections enforcement and to clarify board appointments. That's how it's going to appear on the ballot. Mm -hmm. it's, it's complicated. This is going to be a complicated ballot, uh, mm -hmm. this, this election. You're going to have all of these amendments to vote for. Okay, that's the fourth one. Vote no. Um, uh, let's see, a crime victim's rights amendment. Mm -hmm. This I would say, um, well, what, what's your take on this? This is an act to amend the Constitution of North Carolina to provide better protections and safeguards to victims of crime. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it does, what it does is that it expands constitutional rights of victims in the following way. So the victims will have the right to uh, receive timely notice of court proceedings, uh, be heard uh, pre and be present at any court proceedings to, to restitution in a timely manner, to receive information about conviction and sentence of the accused, and to receive notification of escape, release, proposed parole, uh, part of the accused, and to present the victim's views and concerns when taking an action that would release the accused. Um, I only have one thought about this, and that is that in the surface it actually makes sense. You know, I mean, I'm talking, for instance, about, say, victims of domestic violence, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that, and, and thinking about their safety well being. That would be one thing. There, there's one aspect of this that I think is somewhat insidious, and um, I'm not advocating myself one way or the other uh, to vote for or against, but there's a part that's insidious, and, and it seems like it's going to be uh, kind of like a dog whistle. And the next uh, um, um, amendment that we're going to talk about that's also, I think, co comes under the category of, the of a dog whistle in the following way. Um, violent crime in the United States uh, has been steadily decreasing, steadily decreasing, and constantly decreasing. We are actually becoming a safer country. Um, so uh, in terms of the number of um, you know, violent crimes. However, when you're looking at violent incarceration rates, uh, it's still going up. And this is mostly because of, for instance, the drug war and all of that. Uh, there, there's one aspect of this, because we, uh, the extremists have been built upon this narrative that actually violence is increasing and that society as a whole is becoming more, more violent when in fact it isn't, right? So uh, people who are in the panic and they particularly think, they are feeling that, uh, that, that violent crime is out of control and in their mental image what they have is a black man coming in into their home and essentially assaulting them and killing them. That's, that's their idea. They are going to respond to that. So there is an aspect of this that actually uh, plays onto racial fears about this. However, in the surface of this, it actually sort of makes sense. But uh, my, my the, the, the way that I think about it is the reason why this thing is showing now uh, in about in November is essentially to essentially attract a certain set of the electorate that is actually going to agree with all of the previous amendments that we said that that, that we just sat down and talked about. Right. So it's to to get out the vote. The, yeah. To to sort of energize the Republican yeah. base to vote. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose of this. And right? and the next next amendment that you have uh, essentially pulls out. I mean, I can see victims, uh, cri active a advocates, actually making a good case for mm -hmm. this. Yeah. So so I, I think that people should should make it should should vote their conscience on this to make sure if it in fact goes over there, uh, uh, it, it is actually matches your values. You just have to keep in mind that uh, this the reason why it's showing up in November. Uh, one of the probably uh, the key reason why it's showing up in November, as opposed to other times, is essentially to you know mobilize a certain segment of the electorate. Right, and, and you know, I my concern is uh, is whether this would be enforced equally. You know, on on is this as as you say, is this just something as sort of a signal mm -hmm. to people uh, who are. Uh, essentially racist and, and uh, mm -hmm. fear black on white crime, mm -hmm. you know, uh, are they going to, uh, are they, w will it be enforced equally uh, with white on black or white on brown mm -hmm. crime yeah. or, or in domestic violence? Uh, you know, I don't think that's the target. I, my mm -hmm. gut feeling is that that's not the target of this and, mm -hmm. and would that be enforced equally? And, and so, um, you know, 
whether I, I'm struggling with whether or not, as you, I mean, it does it makes sense that victims mm -hmm. of crime should mm -hmm. should have certain rights, mm -hmm. you know, um, if if it were a level playing field and yeah. and if racism wasn't an, an issue in mm -hmm. this country, but it's hard to deny that racism is an issue and that and that we know that the judicial system uh, yeah. has not been enforce, mm -hmm. enforcing the law equally on yeah. all people, yeah. and so. This would again tend to the consequences of this would would come down uh, harder on the black and brown populations in in um, in the country and in in in, in the state. Um, you know, it's it's just one other way that could be used to mm -hmm. oppress yeah uh, mi be. minorities um, and and, cre and and it's feeding into this frenzy, uh, this concept yes. that all of this black-on-white crime is going on, mm -hmm. and it's not. I mean, it, it is not. It's like a violent crime is going down you know, yeah, in this country. It, yeah, it, it, with maybe the exception of mass shootings. Mass but shootings are going up, but uh, overall uh, violent crime right. uh, is... But, but this is not addressing down. mass shootings. It is not. No. And, 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 and so um, that's, you know... We'll put that uh, under uh, neutral at this moment. Yes, <laughs> at this I, I would point. agree with you on that. Yeah. Case. And the final one, uh, which is the most irrelevant piece of legislation I've ever seen, I think, <laughs> the uh, an act to amend the North Carolina Constitution to protect the right to hunt, fish, and harvest wildlife. Is this right? under attack <laughs> in any way? Okay. Uh, does anybody question that that is a right of, of people? Well, this is essentially it's a null amendment because you are essentially repeating something that is already a right, an implicit right within the Constitution. Yeah. You're just making explicit. Uh, so it creates a constitutional right to hunt and fish, and uh, this is already a right in North Carolina. There is no evidence at all whatsoever that this uh, this right is under threat. Yeah, who's challenging okay, that? Challenging. Yeah. Um, the way to read this, it kind of goes like this. Uh, this is again show like a dog whistle. Yes, uh, there are sportsmen out there uh, that uh, whose main interest is to uh, hunt and fish. Uh, this is a constitutional right. I am not against that. Uh, they are uh, essentially they purchase weapons appropriate for hunting and fishing, uh, to things like that. Um, Which does uh, not include assault rifles. Yeah, they, they do not purchase uh, <laughs> AR-15s uh, for the purpose of, for the purpose of um, essentially uh, gunning down uh, 25 deer in one minute, under one minute. It just doesn't happen, it's not realistic. The thing about this though is that you also have to read between the lines, and it kind of goes like this. Uh, you essentially have an increased drumbeat out there in, um, in the United States for uh, for regulating assault rifles, we are bringing the Second Amendment to view. Uh, there are people out there that will go out to the polls only, only uh, to address issues of Second Amendment, and this reads to good, kind of like a Second Amendment yeah. type of thing. So essentially, responding to that. So there are going to be people out there that are going to vote on this entirely because they say, well, it just makes sense. I'm a hunter and a fisher. I do that. That's perfectly fine. There are people out there that are going to also respond with a sense that. Um, a race war is coming, right? We need to stack up on weapons. This is going to be one way in which you can stock on weapon. However, it is highly unlikely that a weapon that you use to actually um, to uh, to hunt deer or bears will be the same weapon that we use in a race war uh, that uh, <laughs> people are imagining about this. And essentially, um, so 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 there's this component about this because they. Uh, essentially uh, uh, triggers that part of the brain in the limbic system mm. that essentially imagines that the race war is coming. You're going to have black people in mass and Latino immigrants going to come in into your home and you have to make your last heroic stance out there. <laughs> so essentially it's a very dark fantasy that is mm. essentially this gets, play, gets played funny, out but it's not so in funny, people you know. about it. So essentially yeah. this is an amendment that exists primarily to get the what we call the amosexual vote out there. 
and an, uh, the amosexual vote would essentially vote for just about every single amendment behind that, right, um, for this. And this makes sense in the context of uh, you have increased voter dissatisfaction with the way the country is going, uh, people who are very alarmed by the way the Trump administration uh, is moving and the way that extremists in the legislature out there. Um, it is anticipated the possibility that people are essentially going to punish extremists in the Republican Party at a state, federal level uh, from this. And what this thing does is essentially mobilize a very small segment of the population that essentially feeds off these dark fantasies that would mobilize to vote for all of this stuff as well as to vote for also extremist legislature, uh, legislatures here in North Carolina as well as um, in our um, uh, uh, House of Representatives. So I would say just vote on this because it is not uh, vote on this and say no because it is not needed and also to send a signal that uh, we as North Carolinians are not going to respond uh, to dog whistle which of racist uh, pieces of legislature period. So this so technique needs to fail in the ballot box. It, it's, it's a very cynical mm. um, tactic that's being used mm -hmm. by the General Assembly using our government, the yeah. mechanisms of government, and our elections mm -hmm. uh, for partisan purposes, yeah. actually using the state constitutional, mm -hmm. state constitution, and and and, and a, a an almost sacred process to mm -hmm. democracy uh, for their own partisan purposes of getting out the vote, their mm -hmm. the a certain element of their vote, getting them to the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and unfortunately, there's another aspect of this uh, on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. I, I, I subscribe, or I subscribe, I, it, it was sent to me and I haven't desubscribed from mm -hmm. it. I mm -hmm. actually didn't ask yeah. for this, but it's sent to me, uh, is a newsletter by a Democrat, his name is Thomas Mills, who is a, mm -hmm. a moderate Democrat. Mm -hmm. so moderate, I put in quotes, because I don't really think there's anything very moderate about moderate Democrats, mm -hmm. what are called moderate Democrats, um, in which in the last newsletter he sent out, he uh, expressed the opinion that Democrats should not uh, spend a lot of time and energy attempting to oppose the voter ID amendment. Mm -hmm. He was saying, in, in his opinion, it's going to win, there's nothing we can do about it, and it's not worth uh, making a big deal out of it, because that'll tend to get more Republicans to the poll, mm -hmm. to the polls. And um, my, my feeling about that is that that's the um, exact same type of logic that led to the election mm -hmm. of Donald Trump. <laughs> mm -hmm. That um, that Democrats should not speak to principles and mm -hmm. sh should not, um, mm -hmm. sh you know, uh, speak to their base mm -hmm. in the same way that Republicans are speaking to their their yeah. base. That I, I think that the way to counter this mm -hmm. is to run as powerful a campaign as we can to expose the, the politics mm -hmm. behind these amendments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and to, to um, um, get out our base you know in, to the polls I, I th this is th the voter ID law in particular it, it is so egregious in its anti-democratic implications mm -hmm. that uh, it, it, it is uh, we bear responsibility for not speaking out against it well, the, yeah, the position of the um, State Conference of the NAACP and many of our coalition partners, including the Marxist in North Carolina and several of our allies, is that um, we're actually going to campaign against this voter suppression power grab amendments. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do it locally. Uh, the approach that uh, we are going to take locally, and we're talking about all of Western North Carolina, not just the NAACP branches, but our local coalition partners, is that this is going to be in the context, not just speaking against these amendments, but also about raising questions uh, on our legislatures, uh, legislature about, uh, and uh, uh, show bringing to focus 
how particular policies of incumbents at the federal state level have actually affected us uh, locally. So we're talking about increased income inequality. The westernmost counties are seeing an increased rate even th uh, of poverty, even though the economy is doing very well. Uh, we need to have all of these narratives, these moral narratives about the imperatives of taking care of the least of us. And within that, within that narrative, within uh, these arguments that we're going to bring to the public in our material, we're also going to embed the discussion of why is it, why is it that we are seeing increased poverty rate? Why is it that we are seeing increased food insecurity? Why is it that we are not seeing affordable housing? Is because our legislators are not being accountable to the voters. And these methods right here are the means by which these legislators are not making themselves, holding themselves accountable to the voters. That's essentially where we're going to come from. Yeah. Well, that's where the NAACP is yeah. going. And our coalition partners will do. And it, yeah, I, I think the, the progressive community really needs to mobilize yeah. around this. We can't ignore the, these amendments. We have to mm -hmm. uh, actively uh, um, promote them, uh, not promote them, but... but um, mobilize the vote against them. Mo mobilize the vote against them. It has to become a focal point for the campaign. And I, and I don't really care whether you're pr Democrat or Republican for that matter, or, or independent, um, th this is, an, this is a, an issue of democracy and, and fairness, and um, it, it, it should be a nonpartisan battle. You know? um, we, we, we don't need to divide ourselves into Democrats and Republicans. We just have to divide ourselves into do we believe in in democracy or oligarchy, because that is what it's coming down to. I think. Yeah. Well, do you have any parting words for us? Okay. Uh, well, um, we are actually organizing um, uh, to, for this, and I want to invite your listeners to join us uh, in the NAACP, the Jackson County branch of the NAACP. We'll be having a meeting uh, where we have a program where we're going to talk about our strategy for the fall election season. So I want to invite people to come, join the NAACP, be part of this, this wider movement, join our coalition partners. Our next meeting in Jackson County is going to be at Liberty Baptist Church, uh, which is uh, just behind the um, the Human Services Building uh, in, in Silva and it is going to be at 10 o'clock. We'll have a regular meeting at 10 o'clock with a program at 11 this Saturday, uh, July the 21st, uh, 2018. So come on in, be part of the movement, organize, write letters to the editor, uh, go to democracync.org, uh, sign pledge cards that you're going to oppose these amendments, and essentially get the vote out. Mobilize and be part of the get out the vote uh, efforts in your community where you may be. Okay. And I do have one announcement to, to make on, on August 11th. Uh, the NAACP and the Canary Coalition are, are organizing a trip to the, a field trip to the Highlander Center in Newmarket, Tennessee. And if you would like to participate that, in that, uh, you may be aware that the Highlander Center is a historic site where uh, training takes place for community organizers and civil disobedience and uh, activism. Uh, Rosa Parks was trained at the Highland Highlander Center as well as many of the other uh, civil rights leaders of the 60s. Until today, it's still operating and, and fully functional. And uh, the, the uh, field trip is free. Um, we'll be carpooling over there. It's about an hour and a half from Silva and an hour and a half from Asheville. And um, lunch will be provided for about $12 per person for those who would like to uh, participate in that. And um, just call me at 828-631-3447. Uh, That's the Canary Coalition's phone number or info at canarycoalition.org if you would like to participate in that. Enrique, thank you yeah, again absolutely. for joining us. And absolutely. maybe we'll see you next Monday. Uh, maybe we'll see, maybe we'll see okay. what the schedule is like, okay. but, it, but we'll be back, yeah. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, have a great day, and thanks for watching uh, News from the Roots on Mountain Street.